um, welcome to the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan and welcome to Deep Dive events. Uh, Deep Dive events is a fairly new feature in the, uh, in the club and we um, invite experts to look beyond the news, behind the news, and we have in-depth discussions on uh, what's going on in the news. Um, we had session one earlier this month on mental health issues related to COVID-19, and we're having the second session today with uh, two OECD experts who will join us from Paris. My name is Suvendrini Kakuchi, and I will be your moderator today. The first speaker will be Dr. Christopher Prince. Um, he's a senior policy analyst Skills and Employment Division, Directorate for Employment, Labor and Social Affairs, OECD. And following him, we will listen to Mr. Shunta Takino, Policy Analyst, Directorate for Employment, Labor and Social Affairs, OECD. We, um, we will have them speaking and then we will open the floor for an interactive session. And we have a 30 minute specially reserved space for uh, Q&A directly with the um, speakers. Uh, before I give, uh, before we go into the main uh, session, let, can I ask uh, Dr. Prince to give us a quick introduction of a self introduction? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the opening. So my name is Christopher Prince. Uh, I have joined the OECD about 20 years ago, actually a little longer than that. I don't know how much you know about the, the organization we're working for. It's an international think tank. We have uh, 38 countries, countries that are members of this organization, including Japan. It was initially of mostly rich countries. Now we are increasingly expanding to cover more and more middle income countries, in particular from Latin America. And basically what we do is we do research to support policymakers in these countries. And our main advantage and angle to take is really comparative analysis so that we basically support learning from what other countries and governments are doing. And essentially, I think what we find in all our work all the time is every country is struggling with the same kind of problems. And even if you have systems and cultures which are usually different, there's lots you can learn from others. And basically, we are trying to facilitate that learning. Myself, I'm Austrian, and I'm actually not in Paris at the moment, but teleworking from Vienna, a city that Japanese people generally know and like because of the music. Yes. And otherwise, I'm actually, last thing to mention, I'm not a health expert, right? I'm working for an employment, for the employment division in our, the, in our organization. And I'm actually, my background is actually in demography and labor uh, economics. So we're approaching this issue from uh, a labor market perspective, and you will soon hear why we do so. Thanks. Thank you. And, um, and uh, Mr. Takino, yes. Thank Can you very you much. Know? Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Shunta Takino. I also work at the OECD with, uh, with Christopher um, in the skills and employability division. Um, so maybe just to provide a little bit more of background and where we're coming to this work from, um, around two weeks ago now, we released two, um, two policy briefs that are about 15 pages or so long that outline the impact of COVID-19 crisis on mental health and the necessary policy responses. So we have one on tackling the mental health impact of the COVID-19 crisis, an integrated whole of society response. And then the other one is supporting young people's mental health through the COVID-19 crisis and beyond. Um, and so we'll be drawing on the key findings that we outlined there and in an accompanying working paper that will be released uh, in a few months, um, you know, as the backbone of our discussion today. And then on, on me, um, so I'm a Japanese national um, working in the OECD um, as a young associate uh, and as a junior policy analyst, as Suvindrini already introduced. Um, I am also the uh, head delegate for the Japanese delegation to the Youth Seven, which is the um, which is the official engagement group for young people in the G Seven space. So, okay, you. great. Thank you so much. I hope it's not too early for you in Paris. No. Okay, great. <laughs> Since you're teleworking, I guess it's okay. So the first session we're going to uh, talk about um, um, employment and labor and COVID nineteen. So, uh, Dr. Prince, you you go first. 
thank you very much again. So Shunta will share his screen with all of you so that you can follow this presentation. I'd like to start while, while Shunta just referred to the, the last pieces of work that we have published only about two weeks ago. I'd like to mention that we, are, we have not started to work on this subject now in the crisis, but we have actually been working this subject for over 10 years. So it will become very clear in the course of the presentation that many of the issues we're looking at are not issues that only came up now, but long run issues that policy makers need to tackle. Long run issues, which became much more apparent and acute in this crisis, but otherwise it's really not an issue that is new. And I think that's very important to understand. If we shift to the first slide, uh, Sunto, please, then <clears throat> let me start by saying, well, what is this? What are we talking about? We're talking about mental health. And it's very important in this context to understand that mental health concerns all of us. Mental health is not something um, that someone might be affected by. It's something we all have and we all deal with and we all confront. And the World Health Organization has provided a very nice and clear definition of what mental health is and defined it as a state of well being in which every individual realizes his or her own potential, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to her or his community. So basically, it's underlying all our lives in, in, in many ways. And mental health is a very difficult variable to understand in some way. So it's not like age, which is very clear what age you have, or it's not like gender, which only has two or maybe three different possibilities. It has actually, it is more or less, it's more like a spectrum running from very good to very bad mental health. And our health, mental health changes all the time. It changes over the lifetime. It even changes on a day-to-day -day basis, right? So we can have in better or worse mental health on, on different days, weeks, months, and years. And I think partly this is what makes the analysis difficult and confusing because the measurement of mental health is very volatile. But if we go to the next slide, what is so critically important is that mental health is really frequent. And I think that's also the underlying issue why we have been looking into this subject so much. Uh, it's not a rare illness. It's not a mere, rare condition. It's actually some, one, something that in, at any one point in time, one in five people of, with deep populations experience a mental health condition. So you could almost say whenever you, whatever room you are, one in five, of the persons in that very room will have a mental health condition. And I think that was just the starting point of our analysis and often very difficult for, for people and policymakers to understand that this is such a frequent condition. And if you measure it over the life course, it is actually even more frequent and in a way one in two of us will experience a mental health condition at some point over time. What I also want to emphasize is something around terminology and language. So we use in most of our work, the term mental health conditions predominantly. Um, and I'm speaking now, of course, if, about English language here, Japanese language might even uh, be more complex and more difficult to decide upon what the right terminology would be to use. We want to use a language that is person-centered and recovery focused and well aligned with, with all our attempts to raise awareness about this problem and, the ro and, and address the stigma that is still coming with it. Because the stigma around mental health is still huge. And the stigma is often related to, we, we kind of, we're all very scared of having a mental health condition. And that is partly related to the fact that we all think once we have a mental health condition, we will have it forever which is by no means true because the majority of mental health conditions is actually curable and it is epi episodic. It might come back, but it is still not something we have all the time. Only some mental health conditions will be chronic, but that is not special to mental health conditions, right? We have a lot of physical health conditions which are chronic. So our fear of mental health is to some extent not justified, but it explains the stigma around it. And I think it also explains why awareness was so low for a long time. 
because what is also very important, if you look at this um, high frequency of and high prevalence of mental health conditions, this is not a new phenomenon, phenomenon at all, because research really shows that in the last 50 years, the prevalence of mental health conditions has probably not changed. So the issue is not that it has become more and more frequent, but it has actually been very frequent in the past and we have largely ignored that. So the, the starting point of our work 10 years ago really was we must make that frequency known and we must address it in policy. We have overlooked the real issues for, that, for a very long time. And I think the second issue where we, we were able to catch the attention of policymakers really is also by showing how, how costly mental health is to society and the economy. And very conservative estimates would suggest that it's at least 4% of GDP, uh, probably much more than this. And if we look into this, the composition of the costs, it's actually quite interesting because only about a third of that cost would be actual health cost. A similar amount would be social spending for people on social benefits who suffer from some mental health condition. And eventually the largest cost factor is actually costs arising in the labor market through sickness absence, through presenteeism in particular. So people who have a job, but who are underperforming in their job because of their mental health condition. So I think that cost angle was also very important for us to convince policymakers to support that type of work. But there's also another big element behind why we were able to convince policymakers, because not only are mental health conditions very frequent, but they also have very significant implications on a number of outcomes, social and labor market outcomes of those who experience mental health conditions. And I think this small chart is showing you a couple of these elements, because the issue is that mental health uh, is not a mental health, it's not a health issue only, it's an issue that um, impl implicates outcomes in many different ways in many different areas. But the stigma and kind of ignorance towards mental health has also massive implications in the health system itself. And what we find, for instance, if you look at the first of these images here on the health side, we find that two in three individuals who experience mental health conditions have difficulty in accessing medical care. And that's really very uh, irritating and compares very differently to physical health conditions because no, there's not a lot of physical health conditions where people have difficulties in, in accessing care, but in mental health, this is very frequent and under treatment or not full treatment is therefore very, very frequent. So first of all, yes, health, mental health is an issue where, which needs much higher attention in the healthcare system, but it also spills over to many other areas of our life. If we look at use, for instance, mental health has significant implications on the extent to which people are able to complete their education. It has significant implications on the likelihood for people to repeat the grade, to stay in the health in, in the education system for longer and to drop out eventually earlier before having completed schooling. And the result is for, for instance, that the group of people with mental health conditions are much less likely to have completed tertiary education. And we know how important tertiary education is today in the labor market. And in any case, we know how important completed education at all levels is for a successful career. Which brings me directly to the issue of employment. And we do find very clearly that persons with mental health conditions are, have much lower employment rates. Although I should also emphasize, most of those with a mental health condition do have a job. So I think it's also very important and that brings me back to the issue of the definition of mental ill health, most of the health conditions we are talking about is actually what we call as mild to moderate mental health conditions. Uh, in most cases, these are either anxiety related mental, mental health conditions or mood and depression related mental health conditions. These are the two by far most frequent ones. And of course, with these types of conditions, you are perfectly able to work, right? I think it's very important that we do not think of mental 
ill health as very debilitating conditions. Most mental health conditions are not debilitating and you would find most of those people in employment. But nevertheless, they're highly, there's a significant employment gap between those with and without mental health conditions, which we, we need to address. Or if you look at unemployment rates, persons with mental health conditions are at least twice as likely to be unemployed. In some countries, even three times more likely to be unemployed. They're at much higher risk of losing their job. All these matters tremendously. And that brings us uh, to the force of these images here on social benefits. So because persons with mental health conditions have more difficulties in accessing employment and are more at a higher risk to lose their job, they also have a much higher incidence of receiving social benefits and depending on the income they receive from these social benefits. So this is again a statistic that goes across all OECD countries and it suggests that people with um, mild to moderate, about one in three of all those people with a mild to moderate mental health condition receive some social benefit uh, to either as either their only or own the income or at least complementing their income and among those with a more severe mental health condition, it's even 43%, which is more than double the percentage of persons without mental health conditions who would be on social benefits. And it's also important to emphasize in this regard, it's not, it's all kinds of social benefits that are critically important to support the incomes of persons with mental health conditions. It might be disability benefits, but in many countries, it will be predominantly unemployment benefits or neither of the two are predominantly maybe social assistance. Social assistance is actually a benefit which is very often the key income support for persons with mental health conditions. So I think what this story here tells that um, mental health conditions spill over on all kinds of outcomes in our lives. And therefore, if we want to address these issues and if we want to ensure that persons with mental health conditions have better outcomes, we need to eventually look into policies in, in many different fields. And all what I'm describing here is actually the situation well before the COVID crisis. So I think the main point I wanted to make is we're talking about the long standing issue that we have not sufficiently addressed anywhere in OECD countries. And the COVID crisis has had its own impact and, and Chunta will tell you more about that. Thank you, Christopher. So now that we've kind of set out what the situation was like before the crisis, I'd like to share some findings on the impact of the crisis over the past uh, just over a year. Now, as you can see from this chart, um, the prevalence of symptoms of anxiety and depression, which as Christopher mentioned, are the two most common forms of mental health conditions, have increased significantly in all OECD countries for which we have data. And this really shows that the impact, at least the immediate impact of the crisis, was to drive a deterioration in mental health and increase uh, in the prevalence of mental health conditions. So in Japan, we have data pre-crisis and during the crisis for depression. And you can see that the most recent available data on the estimate of the prevalence of symptoms of depression prior to the crisis was 7.9%. But in April 2020, the prevalence was more than twice as high at 17.3%. I think it's important to state the main finding really is that the, it, it, there's been an increase in each country in terms of prevalence of mental health issues, and there are no exceptions, but we need to be a bit careful when comparing across countries. So we can't say with conviction, for example, that the mental health of people in the UK was an average worse than that of Japanese people in April 2020 based on these charts. And why is that? Well, it's because self-reported symptoms are somewhat affected by stigma and awareness in particular. So there's likely to be slightly differing levels of under-reporting from country to country and society to society. Now, I've set out the mental health has declined, but what matters also is whose mental health has declined. And really the evidence here is that there are certain groups like parents with young children, low-income households, those experiencing mental health conditions even prior to the crisis, ethnic minorities, health and care workers, and those who have become unemployed during the labor market crisis that's accompanied the pandemic, these groups have all been particularly hard hit. Really, COVID-19 has shown us, I think it's fair to say, that a key element of health policy, but also labor market policy, has to be to tackle the social determinants. 
So individuals with lower incomes and from more disadvantaged backgrounds are more likely to have poorer mental health. And then COVID-19 came on top of this and affected these groups yet further, um, in many cases, widening inequalities in mental health and labor market outcomes. Now, of course, this applies to all policies, but I just really want to make clear that, you know, if this unequal impact is not addressed through policies, then inequalities in mental health will widen further. And there are also two broad groups I want to mention in a bit more detail. And the, these are women and young people. So it's widely known that women are more likely to report experiencing mental health conditions uh, in the case of both anxiety and depression. Um, and this was the case before the crisis, but it seems these gaps have widened yet further. So in the US, for example, the gender difference in prevalence of mental health issues was estimated to have risen by around 66% in spring 2020. And in the UK, even among working parents with young children, it is the working women who are reporting worse mental health than men. And then for young people, I like to dive into a little bit more detail. So um, one of the clearest patterns we've seen throughout the crisis is the mental health of young people deteriorated more than among the general population at the onset of the crisis. And this really seems to have persisted, as you can see in this chart. And that's really why we decided to provide, produce a dedicated separate policy brief on supporting young people through the mental, uh, through the COVID-19 crisis. Um, and here you can see that, um, yeah, the, in France, for example, with only a few exceptions, the prevalence of symptoms of anxiety and depression have been consistently higher. And it's worth noting too, that as you can see, this is longitudinal data. So it goes up to April, 2021, um, but we're not actually seeing significant improvements in mental health. If anything, in some cases, there's a worsening. So for example, for young people, the highest rate of anxiety and depression seen during the crisis happened in March, 2021, which is not what you might expect. And this is not just about France, um, but also we have longitudinal data from Belgium and, and the US. And in these three countries, what we see is the pre prevalence of symptoms of anxiety and depression have more than doubled among young people. And as of March, 2021, uh, prevalence was around 30% to 80% higher among young people compared to the general population. Now, we have a little bit of data on this also for Japan, um, actually also for countries like Canada, Italy, and the UK. And here you see that in Japan, 20, 20, 20 29-year-olds are about 70% more likely to report symptoms of depression than the general population, according to one survey conducted in July 2020. And so there's nothing, nothing points, well, everything points to the, the fact that the situation in Japan is comparable to that in many other countries in terms of young people being adversely affected and there being an increase uh, in mental distress amongst the general population. Now, of course, this hasn't come out of nowhere and it's worth discussing a little bit what, what is driving these declines in mental health. And one finding we've had, which is interesting, is the mental health is actually closely correlated with the extent of COVID-19 deaths and strictness of confinement measures. So basically stricter confinement measures have been correlated with better, well, sorry, stricter confinement measures have been correlated with worse mental health. Um, but it's, it is quite difficult to tease out what exactly it is that is driving the overall declines and to separate out, for instance, the, the economic crisis and the health crisis impacts. But what we can say is that at a population-wide level, there's been a significant decrease in so-called protective factors, mental health, like social connection, financial stability, employment, and access to mental health services, while there's been a notable rise in risk factors from poor mental health, like isolation, poverty, and uncertainty. And of course, the situation differs from individual to individual, and the extent to which risk factors have increased and protective factors have decreased is also closely associated in many cases with socioeconomic status. So with that, um, Chris, Christopher and I have set out what was the situation before the crisis and what is the situation uh, during the crisis and you know, with most recent data up to April 2021. So I'll pass back to Suvendrini for any questions. Yes, thank you very much. That was very interesting. Um, of course, um, there's lots of questions that I would like to ask, like, um, you know, the, 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 um, the, um, the current situation in, in Japan. But before I do that, would, would anyone like to 
uh, pitch in from on online or from the floor. Any questions from the from the audience? Okay, if not, um, just to get yes, 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 but please. Just, just go ahead, yeah. yeah. My, my name is Kurt Sieber. I'm an associate member here at the club. Um, connection with the first uh, meeting we had, um, my question is, do you see a direct connection between mental health and uh, suicide um, in terms of age or in terms of what kind of persons? Do, are there any uh, data available to put these two together or to to, <clears throat> well, to study the impact uh, on on one on, on on one side to the other side okay thank, thank you. you very much who would like to take that i the uh, question seems to kind of d delve deeper into what you're saying like you've talked about the rise in mental health issues like depression and anxiety, but how do you relate that with, uh, with a rise in suicide? So in, any comment on that? Well, thank you very much for the, the question. Um, Christopher might supplement what I have to say, um, but it's worth keeping in mind that, well, suicide is only one, uh, you know, suicide is often the end result of a very complicated process and a very unfortunate thing that happens and is, um, you know, something that we need to address. And, you know, so in our brief, you'll find that we do talk about the importance of suicide protection policies and prevention policies. Um, now, in terms of what we're seeing in terms of suicide trends, um, the evidence is not that clear at the moment. So Sakamoto-san, who I know um, spoke uh, two weeks ago, I think it was, um, has been doing research on, on suicide trends. When we actually look at it from an international context, there's been a few studies that showed that in the early you know, periods of the COVID-19 crisis, so really from say spring 2020 to summer 2020, there wasn't actually any increase in prevalence, uh, it, sorry, increase in the, the rate of suicide amongst the general population. Now, there are two important caveats, I think, to add to this. The first thing is that this is really at the beginning of the crisis. So we don't really know what the situation is say now or what the situation will be in three years time. And so it's important that we actually keep that in mind and we continue to monitor um, suicide rates and what's happening. The second thing to keep in mind is that the, the a, lot, a lot of these studies just look at the general population and it's not broken down by age or socioeconomic characteristics or gender. So in the case of Japan, there's slightly more specific data so I know there was data, I think, from November 2020, um, which showed, you know, increase, concerning increase amongst um, children, adolescents and women. But, you know, it's difficult for us to draw conclusions because at the international level, there's less, um, should we say, kind of broken down data, disaggregated data. Um, and it's important, actually, as, as I'll go into later, that we continue to actually improve the data we have on mental health. And that also is partly about uh, suicide rates. So we understand what's happening and whether policies are working. Okay, thank you. Dr. Prince, any comment? Well, maybe I can just add, first of all, I'm, I'm not surprised about that question. In a way, I think um, this is kind of the expected discussion to have in a country like Japan, where mental health is still considerably suffering from stigma, that the one issue that is talked about is suicide. But I think it's very important that we as Shunta said, suicides are usually the very end of a very unfortunate journey where a lot of things have gone wrong and bad and where policy kind of has failed to make the difference that it could make at, the, at all these different stages. So it's eventually the end result of, of policy failure. I think it's also an issue that is talked about because there is data on suicides in, in most countries. And we'll come to the discussion of data in, in the second part of our presentation, but I think 
collecting other than suicide data would be very important because the suicide discussion limits us to a very um, narrow angle to mental health. And of course, the, it is generally understood that it's the end result of kind of the, 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 the worst end of the mental health continuum that I described in the beginning from good health to bad health. And, at, and it's particularly unfortunate because as we say, um, mental health status changes so much, it's so volatile, and it could just be a, a, short, a small moment of where it's really so bad that there is no other escape anymore than, than committing suicide. So of course, the, there's nothing more urgent in some way to prevent suicides, but I think it's particular. the issue is you can only prevent it by better policies in all kinds of areas, not especially targeted at suicide prevention, but eventually leading to suicide prevention. Okay, thank you. Um, Milton, yeah. I'm Milton. Uh, I'm Milton Issa, a longtime member as well. Uh, where do you draw the line? of distinction between mental health and physical health for things like addiction to drugs or alcohol or tobacco. I think it's, uh, it's kind of hard to classify. And if you could give us your insight, how you consider uh, in your studies, uh, the distinction between physical health and mental health. Yes, any one of the two speakers. Well, maybe I can and have a start and Shunta can add afterwards. I think that's a very important question. And 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 I think I would like to carry it a little further because I think the links between physical and mental health are considerable and considerably important in many, many ways. Like for instance, we know that mental health conditions, as people who have mental health conditions have much higher risks of all kinds of physical health conditions, which is actually, an additional reason why also just within the health system, much more focus on mental health and mental ill health would be highly necessary and highly efficient to reduce uh, healthcare spending because the ignorance of the mental health, of mental health conditions very often worsens physical health conditions and we are suddenly confronted with much higher, a much higher challenge and the, accordingly much higher costs and much lower chances of, of um, treatment. More specifically, your question on, on addiction. Addiction is normally classified as a mental health condition, but as you rightly imply, it has a lot of, of physical health conditions as a result, right? So it's, I totally agree that drawing the line would be very difficult also within measurement and data systems, right? Even for, if you, that is also why it's very difficult and very, for countries to provides something which seems like a very simple estimate. What share of your healthcare spending goes to physical health and what goes to mental health? Sounds like a trivial question, but it's far from trivial. And that's why we even struggle to get half good data on that subject from member countries. Even though in any case, all the data suggests that uh, spending on, on mental health condition is less than 10% of total healthcare, which is hilariously low and clearly showing that mental health is not on a par with physical health in the consideration by by the mental health system itself not to speak of of systems outside of health yes thank you and no okay fine um before we go on to the next uh, session i just want uh, just maybe a, uh, a comment for me the message i'm getting from both um both um, presentations was that maybe we were just not prepared for this um, this aspect of uh, a, a major crisis, and this time it's the pandemic. And why is that? I mean, is uh, because we've gone through huge disaster, for example, natural disasters in Japan. And, uh, you know, other countries have gone through um, even major economic crises. So were we prepared or, I mean, were we not, you know, to face this? Or, and, and is this an opportunity now to be prepared better? I think I'd be happy to answer this from the perspective of mental health. So, 
you know, whether how well prepared countries were, you know, this is a, a big, a big question. Um, but in terms of mental health, I think basically the evidence suggests that, you know, countries and health systems, labor markets, we're not, we're not prepared for the crisis that is happening. Um, and I think what's, you know, we're, we're coming back to this time and time again, but a lot of the, one of the reasons for that, I think, is that the, the lack of awareness around mental health that persists and the high levels of stigma around mental health, which has meant that mental health and mental health policy has been an area that's not been given enough attention before the crisis. And so in a way, it's no surprise that when a crisis like this happens, that our policies are not adequately prepared and can't respond in the way we, we want. We want. Um, so I think that's what I would, I would say in response to that question. And, and, but that does also mean that there's an opportunity here insofar as the very fact that we're having a discussion today on mental health, that we got invited from the FCCJ for this, for this talk, I think shows that we're having this society-wide discussion on mental health. And so the way we like to think about it in a forward-looking way is let's think, okay, how can we capitalize on the momentum, the discussion around mental health that's happening now and translate that into policy change and make sure that when you know, a crisis happens again or there's a situation that places, uh, that causes mental distress, that we as a society um, are better prepared. I think it is normal though, that given the current circumstances, the very extreme circumstances, the unprecedented circumstances we are facing, that many people are reporting mental health uh, concerns. I don't think that's surprising. I, I think, you know, that's why we're also interested in seeing what's going to happen, you know, further down the line. And we don't have the answer to that. Um, but that's something we'll be monitoring over the coming months, years, so we know what has been the long term impacts of this crisis. Thank you. Yes. Um, so maybe we can go to the next two presentations, and that's going to be on the policy responses to address mental health issues. So yes, yeah, let's indeed let me turn to policy, although we touched upon policy in our discussion already. I think the key message that we want to give is mental health is not just a health issue. And therefore, health policy alone is not good enough to tackle the issue we are seeing. I think that's that that's a key message that we should never forget. So in, instead, what is actually needed is a integrated mental health and all policies approach. It is needed, it would have been needed in the past already, but is even more so needed now going forward. And as Shunta said, let's let's hope that this pandemic will also be a catalyst for for policy change. We often say that the crisis is also presenting some opportunity. I think in this case, this might hopefully be the case that because the level of awareness is exploding, we, we do see better policies coming up. In a, in a, so basically the crisis just made it more clearer than ever before how important a good policy in this space would be. If we move on to the next slide, please, Sunta. Uh, I'd like to distinguish first um, immediate action from long-term policy change. So, of course, we are now seeing a real crisis in this very moment, which we need to address immediately, right? So I think that's also the, the first and foremost concern of policymakers at the moment. So okay, basically, we need action um, now, irrespective of whether, even if we don't know whether this um, high prevalence that we now are measuring is here to stay or whether we will hopefully see a decline to normal levels of prevalence again, we need to act now. And this, this immediate action is actually needed at every level from an individual level to a policy level. So there are things that we all can do as individuals. And that's in the first left box here, making sure that we have a regular and good amount of sleep, that we have enough time for exercise, that we use our own ways to whatever routine we need, whatever ways we need to be in a good space, to use applications that are now mushrooming and to make sure that our social network is not, not falling apart, even though we have often been asked to stay at home. Otherwise, I think what is really key is that we need to be aware that any policy that we are 
devising has an impact on mental health, right? And I think that's something we're also slowly getting a, a bit of feeling for. If we decide to close schools, this has tremendous impact on children and on their mental health. If we force people to telework instead of going to the office, this has a significant impact on people's lives and social lives and therefore their mental health. And of course, at the same time, we see uh, things like uh, rising unemployment, rising dependence on, on income support. That is well known that this has significant impact on people's mental health. Otherwise, I think there's two, two issues. We, we, first of all, we need to make sure that in terms of policies, we have very low threshold support, which is low threshold support basically means support that is very easily accessible without first having to go through all kinds of uh, health assessments, right? And for low threshold supports, we need to offer them in everywhere in the society. And in this box here, left, uh, left corner and left lower corner, this is mostly focusing on young people but we need something like that for, for all policy fields. So in case of young people, we need to make sure that youth centers and schools have a particular uh, focus on integrated support and are aware of the high prevalence of, of mental health conditions and, and, and supporting those who you see are struggling um, with where they could go to, to improve. And Lastly, we also need a stronger focus on specialist mental health. And I think it was quite shocking sometimes in this current crisis because prevalence has suddenly peaked so so dramatically. Uh, what we hear from different countries is, well, unless you had a very, very life uh, risking mental health issue, there was no way that the hospital could ever have offered any support in this moment. And the waiting list was just exploding, right? And I just had a seminar in, uh, in Germany last week, and they said the waiting list for psychiatric services has now increased to about one and a half years, which essentially means that people, we have not reached one and a half years into this crisis, right? So no one who has been affected by the COVID crisis has actually been able to, to get uh, access to psychiatric services. We're still dealing with people from before the crisis. And of course, that is very traumatic. But I think it's also important to understand that this immediate action is going hand in hand with actually long-term policy challenges. And this is, if you go to the next slide, I, I said in the outset, right, that we have been working on this for over 10 years. We actually started work on mental health and its link with the labor market pretty much exactly 10 years ago. Uh, it, it, it came out of our work on, on, on sickness and disability policy when we actually realized that better disability policies have achieved quite a lot in many ways, but have largely failed to tackle new issues around mental health. And it was not new issues because of a new prevalence, but because of so suddenly we saw in many, disabilities, many, many of our systems that the rising awareness of mental health has led to a, an apparent ups. Um, kind of fast rise in many of the outcomes related or caused by mental health. Like we saw in many, in most OECD countries, enormous increase in the use of, of medicine for, for depression and anxiety, uh, which hasn't been available to the same extent before. We see in most countries a, a rapid increase in the share of people on sick leave for applying for disability benefits because of mental health conditions. And the truth is, this is not because these conditions are more frequent, but we are now actually seeing that the mental health condition these people have is, is what is more important for their labor market struggles than other health conditions that used to be um, in the forefront as an argument for their struggles, because there is also this close link between mental health and physical health. So we have been doing work on, on the links between mental health and and education and employment for a large number of years and eventually came up with a set of policy conclusions and guidelines, which were then translated in what is called the OECD recommendation on integrated mental health skills and work policy. And such an OECD recommendation is actually a formal legal instrument that our organization can come up with. 
but it's not a binding instrument because we are just an, an organization advising governments, right? We're not telling, we're, we're suggesting good, better policy, but we're not in a position to tell governments what they should do. But what they can do and what they did in this case is that they committed themselves to the policy principles of our recommendation. And this is quite something because actually that uh, recommendation was formally signed by all health and all employment ministers from all 38 OECD countries, including Japan. And in a way, binding themselves to improve policies in this field. And just to speak to Japan, uh, Japan was not uh, a major actor within our work in this field, but they were very interested and in following very eagerly to what the work has delivered and were eventually a very strong supporter of that OECD recommendation. So I think even already back in 2015, the Japanese government was very aware that better policy is needed in this space and was very happy that the OECD was bringing this topic to the fore. And basically the main elements in this recommendation are that we are asking for a much timelier action. So the focus is really on early intervention in all kinds of policy arenas on integrated action so that we provide integrated uh, supports and services like uh, just to give an example that an employment service would provide both employment service and health service hand in hand to be able to help persons to return to the labor market. And we also suggested that um, we need new actors to get involved in particular first line actors. So it's because we speak so much about low threshold supports, we need to involve um, people who are not health specialists, but who are dealing with mental health, health issues of their clients, of their pupils, of their workers at first hand. So we came up with policy guidelines for health systems, use policies, workplace policies and welfare systems. And now five years later, and it was in the midst of the crisis, we had been asked to review the recommendation and the success of it. And we, we did that uh, during the crisis. Uh, so mostly looking into policies just before the COVID crisis, right? Uh, we did find that in the use policy space, quite a lot has happened. So a lot of countries have made significant progress towards a, a, a timelier and more integrated approach in terms of dealing and offering services for, for young people. On the other hand, we find that social protection and welfare policies have really been lagging behind. So there's very poor understanding in these systems, uh, how much a role they play in terms of um, better mental health, better approaches to mental health. Healthcare systems and workplace policies have seen some improvements in some countries and no improvements in others. So overall, I think we were quite uh, satisfied to see some change, but of course we have we're far away from what, what, what the guidelines really suggest should be done. And if we move to the next slide, please, then just wanted to give you two examples, one on, on uh, use and education policy and one on, on labor market and work policy, just to and this make it a little bit clearer what this link is between mental health and these other areas of policy. So starting with, with ed education, right? We know that completing education is absolutely key to finding and keeping work throughout the life course and making a successful career. Now, what has happened in this current crisis is that educational institutions have been closed in most OECD countries, often for very long periods, sometimes closed, reopened, closed again, reopened again, very exhausting for those uh, attending these in educational institutions and meaning that there was a huge risk of uh, losing the engagement of, of some of those in these institutions, in, in schools or, or higher education institutions. Countries have certainly put in place some measures to support remote learning. So if we've seen big uh, progress there, but not everywhere and in very even ways. So there's, there's a high risk that we lose actually those who are most disadvantaged. And I think that is a key issue that is particularly apparent among um, youth and around the education system that we see rising inequality, right? Those who have already struggled in schools most were those who struggled most with this shift towards online remote learning, who might not have been equipped sufficiently to 
participate fully in such type of learning. Uh, so the education outcomes are for uh, the, the gap in outcomes is getting bigger and, and, and we there's a huge risk of losing this group. And of course, this is also spills over to also the, the older ones in, in the education, uh, those who are completing their degrees, they do find now a very bleak labor market. So it also means that we need to make much more efforts to support that transition from education into work. I think that's a key policy in any case for persons who struggle with mental health conditions because they generally find that transition much more difficult. And in this crisis now with such um, small job number of jobs being offered for a while, this transition is even more important. If, if we just switch to the next slide here, this is a similar story around the labor market and mental health, right? So the COVID crisis has very quickly become a jobs crisis and has resulted in a fast rise in unemployment in all, in all countries. And we know how important it is for good mental health to have a good quality job and a meaningful job. And that crisis suddenly meant that, that many of us have lost their job, either indeed through unemployment or maybe just through much reduced number of, of hours of work. And in that sense, just to give as a side, um, these schemes, which are called job retention schemes or short-term work schemes, which allow people to keep the employment contract and work very low hours. In some countries, it was even possible in this particular period to work no hours at all and remain, uh, keep the employment contract. These kind of schemes have actually helped much to cushion mental health impacts of the crisis. So we, we do see that if people were allowed to work a few hours, it was made a huge difference for the mental health compared to having lost their job altogether. And of course, that had a lot to do also with the security around still having employment and not having to um, be worried about the future. And related to this also, it's very important that those who are unemployed and looking for a job are taken care of by active labor market policies provided by employment services. Uh, and that these services uh, have a strong attention to mental health. We also know that even, even just being in, in labor market programs, speak edu education programs or other programs is already giving people structure and therefore already improving their mental health in some way. So it's, it's very important that those who are seeking employment are not left alone. And with that, I'll, I'll hand over again to Shunta, who, because all, all that I said was of a general nature and applied to all OECD countries in any way, both uh, during the crisis and before the crisis and also after the crisis. And, and Shunta will give you a little more detail on, on the Japanese context and around this area. Thank you, Christopher. So now I'd like to share, you know, based on all these findings, what are some Japan specific policy considerations. Um, so first things first, I think lack of awareness, and I know we've mentioned awareness and stigma over and over again, but I really don't think it can be overemphasized just how big of an issue it is, not only in Japan, but in many other countries. And but having said that, as you can see here, actually, and this isn't a perfect measure by any means, it's very difficult and it's very limited uh, data on cross-country comparison of awareness and mental health issues. But you can see from this Ipsos survey, the people in Japan out of these countries were least likely to consider seeing a mental health professional as a sign of strength. And so this is clearly a key challenge that existed before the crisis. We don't have data from after the crisis, but clearly we can do more in Japan, I think, to raise public awareness and address the stigmatization of mental health issues. And this is really a challenge for multiple reasons that I like to set out a bit more formally. So first, uh, it can create false narratives about individuals with mental health issues being unable to do the kind of daily activities like going to school or work, when in most cases they can with support, as Christopher's already mentioned. It can create an environment where people are unlikely to seek support for mental health issues, even when they may be experiencing symptoms. And I think this chart captures that impact of stigma and low levels of awareness very well. And just as importantly, I think, it can mean that people experiencing mental health conditions are unlikely to be referred to the support they need in a timely manner. 
And that's because the people they interact with may be prone to dismissing symptoms of mental health issues or not recognizing them because they don't understand mental health as well as perhaps they could. Now, a silver lining really, as I've already mentioned, of the COVID-19 crisis is that there's been discussions around mental health. So how can we make the most of that um, momentum? And we, we've seen from many countries, often working closely with nonprofit organizations and charities, um, efforts to raise awareness of mental health through campaigns. Um, but in terms of kind of more concrete, clear policy levers, I think ensuring frontline actors are trained in mental health is really, really important. And that means training primary care practitioners in the health system. It means teachers and educators in schools and universities. It means line managers and senior executives at work. And it means caseworkers in labor offices and employment services. Now, a notable example of a country that's taking these kinds of concrete steps, which Japan could perhaps learn from, is the United Kingdom, um, where there's been a really concerted effort, especially in the education sector, when it comes to uh, training frontline actors. So the government's committed to ensuring every school and college in England receives training in mental health by 2025. And this has been accompanied by increased financial commitments. And it's really not just about making teachers understand mental health. So the LINK program in England is actually also designed to improve partnerships and communication between schools and health services, and aims to ensure referrals can be made from schools to specialist support where necessary. And this is the kind of integrated action we're talking about because it's really important that if a mental health issue is identified in a school setting or a workplace setting, that, and then it's identified that individual might need specialist support, how can we make sure there is a pathway to ensure that individual receives mental health support? And I think this is an area where many countries, including Japan, could definitely make some progress. And of course, these lessons, you know, as I said, frontline actors across society. So these lessons apply also to the workplace. And so in our policy brief, for example, we talk about how countries like Japan may want to consider um, if financial incentives for mental health training of line managers might be something to consider, because that might help to raise awareness of mental health issues and actually help make men, uh, workplaces more mentally healthy. And if we're talking about who these policies should target, then there might be some consideration that small and medium sized enterprises might be a particular target here. Now, more specifically on workplaces, we actually know that compared to other countries, Japan has, you know, a relatively speaking, much lower unemployment rate than most OECD countries. And the impact on unemployment has been significant, but smaller than um, in many OECD countries. And as Chris has kind of already touched upon the importance of policies to support unemployed people and support them back into work, I'd like to talk less about that and more about how, how to make sure the workplace and work itself contributes to good mental health. So we know certain risk factors at work, such as long working hours and conflict with managers and colleagues, and that these can result in poor mental health. And one progressive step that I think Japan could take is actually go beyond its stress check policy. Now, this is a policy that's in place in Japan um, that uh, basically is a legal requirement for employers to conduct surveys of their employees and to offer those reporting high levels of mental distress with the uh, option to book an appointment with a physician or a mental health specialist if they wish. Now, employers are then required to make workplace adjustments to better support the employee um, while also, yeah, it's just better support them in working while also managing a mental health issue. Now, of course, I'm not saying that this policy is necessarily bad. What I'm saying is that more can be done than this. So this is quite a reactive policy. Um, and so I think Japan can do more to think about how to actually proactively promote mental health to complement this existing measure. So thinking about how to make work itself mentally healthy, rather than thinking about how do we support people at work who show symptoms of mental health issues. So in this context, Canada's national standard, for example, sets out a good case to follow. So the national standard sets out 13 factors for promoting mental health. And it really goes beyond focusing on narrow factors that we often talk about, like workload management and counseling, but also looks at factors like organizational culture, providing opportunities for growth, and creating a sense of connectedness among employees in day-to-day -day work. And a survey in 2019 of, this, of the impact of this Canadian national standard found that employees in companies implementing the standard 
uh, were significantly less likely to say that their workplace is psychologically unhealth or unsafe. And really that suggests that clearly if the government can work with the relevant partners, so in, this, in Canada's case, they worked with the Mental Health Commission of Canada, uh, if, if there's a possibility to set up these guidelines, it's clear that with the right kind of guidelines, employers also have much to benefit. And the Thriving at Work Independent Review in the UK similarly um, takes this promotion approach um, and some of the aspects it sets out is, for example, the greater challenges facing small and medium sized enterprises, as I've already touched upon, and the role that the public sector can, for example, play in showcasing how to ensure workplaces are mentally healthy. Now, I'd like to now go on to teleworking. And um, one of the impacts, really, of the COVID 19 crisis has clearly been that there's been a shift. Uh, a significant proportion of people who have never teleworked or worked from home before are suddenly now in a way forced to telework um, or are choosing to telework. Now, and actually I'm aware that, for example, in Japan, the government set this target of a 70% teleworking target. I'm not actually here to comment on, you know, whether countries, how successfully countries have shifted to teleworking or not. I think that's a slightly complicated story. And, um, but what's really clear is that there's been an unshifted, unprecedented shift towards teleworking, and this has significant implications for mental health. So you can see for some EU countries here, there's been a significant increase. It's more than a doubling of rates of teleworking amongst these four um, countries, France, Germany, Italy, and Spain. And in Japan, um, there was a notable rise in rates of teleworking at the onset of the crisis. Although it's worth keeping in mind that the extent to which this has happened differs based on the measure that is used. Now, the reason why this all matters in terms of mental health uh, is that you know, new forms of work require new forms of policy responses. And the existing literature really, at the moment, actually provides limited concrete evidence uh, on the impact of teleworking mental health. And that's really because the extent to which we're seeing teleworking now is really unprecedented. Um, but you know, it's, it's clear that there are some benefits associated with teleworking, like more flexible working arrangements, but telework can also blur the boundary between work and home. It can contribute to extended working hours, and it can result in a sense of detachment from the workplace. And all of these can have a negative impact on mental health. And there is some emerging evidence that suggests that these impacts are already occurring. So remote workers in some countries are reporting both longer and more irregular working hours. So a survey covering 28 countries from November to December 2020 found that almost half the respondents were reporting working more unconventional hours due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, this is a very new challenge. And so there's very few policy responses that we've seen that relate specifically to mental health. Um, but one that has been interesting uh, in this emerging field is the right to disconnect. So in December 2020, prompted by renewed challenges in maintaining work-life balance, especially posed by teleworking, lawmakers in the European Parliament called for a law that allows workers to exercise a right to digitally disconnect outside working hours without risk of repercussions. Now, it's not as simple as let's put in this policy, it's gonna work um, because there's a challenge remaining to put in place the supporting measures to make sure that this actually translates into the kind of action we want to see. So a 2017 study in France found that actually, despite the introduction of this kind of measure in 2016, around 78% of workers still sometimes often access work-related communications during the weekend or holidays. So it's an interesting policy, but maybe there's some need to supplement that with some supportive measures. And lastly, I'd just like to talk about the need to scale up um, data collection and how Japan can do much more to monitor trends in population mental health. And here you can actually see data from the US um, from April 2020 to now on the prevalence of symptoms of anxiety or depression for certain groups. And you can actually really see that certain groups are particularly affected, young people, people with lower education, women, certain ethnic minority groups. And for example, I talked about how we know young people have been particularly affected. The reason why we know that is because the data is here. And likewise, we've actually been able to glean that glean the, the link and association between strictness of confinement measures and mental health because we also have longitudinal data from countries like Canada, France, the Netherlands, New Zealand, and the UK. And by comparison, in Japan, we have far less data available, um, both in terms of general population data, but even more so in terms of data that's kind of stratified and broken down and disaggregated, whether that be by age, 
socioeconomic circumstances, ethnicity, or other factors. And we feel that a commitment to actually collecting and monitoring population mental health, and not just suicide, as Chris has already, Christopher has already said, would go a long way to providing that valuable evidence base from which we can actually see which populations need to be targeted in mental health policies and what policies are needed to close inequalities in mental health. And it would actually allow us to see if the kind of policies we're putting into place is having the right kind of impact. We can see the impact of potential lockdown measures on mental health, for example. And even in countries like the US and France, actually the collection of this data in a regular way is quite a new phenomenon. And it's been motivated by the need to track the impact of the pandemic and, it's a and, the, and the accompanying crisis on mental health. And so even in these countries, the value in this data really becomes apparent when there's a long-term commitment to collecting data on mental health. And so with that, the, the key messages I wanted to cover um, are done, but here, here are some of just some of the key conclusions, takeaways we can take from the presentation. So mental health has affected many people even before the COVID-19 crisis, but policies were often not ensuring the timely support and treatment that was needed. And the COVID-19 crisis has come on top of this, resulting in a rise in the share of people experiencing mental health issues. But it does remain to be seen whether this is a lasting increase or what is going to happen in one year time, two years time, a decade's time, et cetera. Now, awareness of mental health has risen during the crisis. And this moment, this moment can be used to kind of drive policy forward and increase investment in mental health services too. And really a mental health in all policies response is required to address the mental health impact of the COVID-19 crisis and avoid long lasting impacts. Um, so with that, I'd like to finish um, by putting in place a few sources for support um, for anyone who might be experiencing uh, mental health issues and who might be looking for support. And you can also find out more about the OECD's work on mental health and if you go on the coronavirus or COVID-19 hub, you can see the two policy briefs uh, that I previously referred to. So with that, I'll pass back to Suvendrini. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think we can uh, open up again for an exchange. It, I hear there's, a, a, you know, there are a lot of young people uh, listening online, I assume. And since we have the message that mental health issues are affecting youth uh, in far greater numbers than the other um, sectors of the population, any questions from uh, young, um, the younger audience? Yes? Please, uh, you can type it. And while we wait for the question, I was, um, thinking if the uh, speakers would like to say a little bit more about teleworking and you know with a focus on Japan because teleworking um, as you said you know for mental health um, to support mental health you need social networking and I think in Japan there's a lot of you know like I mean social networking over alcohol and uh, and and at, you know, office colleagues go around and, you know, sp spend a lot of time after work together. And the policies right now don't, uh, you know, allow that. As you might know, in Japan, we have a no alcohol policy right now. So maybe some comments on, on those kind of policies. Are they really good for mental health or not? But um, I, just let me get the question now from, uh, from the online audience. Thank you, Saito-san. Yes, Fujimoto-san, what was your uh, question? Yes. Um, yes. I would type it. I'm now typing the question on chat box. Um, since so, I don't okay. have access to the chat box, you can oh, okay. you, you can say it out aloud as well. Okay, thank you. And thank you for the presentation. Um, I found it interesting that um, the regarding public awareness to Japan and South Korea is very low compared to um, South American countries like Me Mexico or Colombia. Um, I wonder why the, those South American countries uh, is very high. Um, this is the, is that because 
um, education is very is well developed or cultural difference. Okay, thank you very much. Who wants to answer that? I'd be happy to, to answer that yes, and also um, Savendrini, your question relating yes. to, to telework. So um, I think it's, it's we, we don't know awareness that well. It's very difficult to measure the extent to which there is awareness. And in a way, that's why I said it's an imperfect measure, right? Because actually it might be capturing cultural factors. It might also be capturing awareness. But I think what we can say is that if people don't feel like, feel like it's weak to ask a mental health professional for support, that is a problem in the Japanese context. So I think that's how I, how I presented it. But this is an area where we're actually quite interested in maybe doing a li little bit more work so we can understand which countries might have higher levels of awareness, which countries might have lower levels of awareness. What are the evidence-based practices that can increase awareness? Because that evidence at the moment is not entirely clear. So that's why, for example, when I was talking about awareness, I talked about um, the importance of training frontline actors, because that has a very clear implication and we know the consequences and the benefits of such a policy. So this is something that you know we're really looking into and hopefully we can get back to you with something more concrete you know, in the months and years ahead. Um, and then just on, on teleworking, um, one thing actually, I just wanted to use the opportunity to say one thing I missed, which is actually that um, we know that increased teleworking is likely to persist in some form. It's not just like a short run passing phenomenon. Um, of course, not all jobs can be done remotely. So I think in the EU, for example, they estimated only 25% of jobs can be done fully remotely. And that tends to be leaning towards, you know, higher skill of occupations. So that's worth keeping in mind. But, you know, a survey in Japan, for example, found that about 79% of employees wanted to um, telework or occasionally telework beyond the COVID-19 crisis. So it's not just a short run phenomenon. That's why, that's why I raised it. It's not just, you know, an immediate policy response, but a long-term structural challenge. And then Savindrini, your question on, um, you know, specifically on, on, on alcohol policy. Well, just being frank, it, we, I, don't, I don't have that. It's a very specific policy and it's hard to say it's either good or bad. Um, but what we definitely can say is that social connectedness is a huge issue. Um, and governments should be looking at ways to kind of make sure that employees, people generally kind of can maintain that connectedness. And we know, for example, that levels of isolation are particularly high amongst young people again. And we know that isolation is a risk factor for mental health, for poor mental health, should I say. Okay, thank you. Just, um, I, so, the, Trina, I'd yes, like to yes. add, add two, thing, two, two small points for the discussion. One is around what Shunta just said, this, this highly uneven incidence of telework around um, across different occupations and types of jobs. I think that's a moment where we, which we should use to really emphasize rising inequality again, right? So we have populations which are not at all able to telework and who experience that crisis in a very different way than some of, of the other groups. And I think that's rather different worlds and rather different issues and rather different policies required. At, at the same time, I think also the crisis has helped to kind of make it possible for workers to telework, which were never thought of being in a job that could be done in uh, at home and which quickly turned out, well, actually most of our jobs or a lot of our jobs, unless those where you really need to treat uh, and have to deal with people um, directly, it can be done at home, right? Uh, there's, it goes from simple things like, well, I think jobs of assistance were, were never being allowed to done from home and it quickly turned out, well, there's no problem at all to do them from home. So at, at least I think there's also uh, changes and some things are breaking up in terms of inequalities. But I, I think, again, we, we see a lot of inequalities rising and that, that's an issue we need to address in all our, our, all our policies. And the other comment I wanted to make is on our alcohol policy. While we are not experts on this, we do have actually colleagues in our health division who are experts and who have published only last week, uh, a report on the impact of COVID-19 on alcohol. And so I hope I have not looked at this policy brief. Maybe some of the 
answers that you're looking for could be found with this policy brief. And the same group of people have also published a large report on uh, alcohol before COVID-19. So we please look at our website. There is some interesting stuff on around this as well. Okay, I'll give the floor to Mr. Kitano. Yes, please ah, go thank ahead. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. I'm here, Noli Kitano, and majoring in uh, organi organizational behavior. As in the presentation, uh, telewalking can have uh, both negative and positive impacts on mental health. And I think one of the reasons, uh, causes for it is techno stress, which is a uh, stress that you uh, get by dealing with like I ICTs. And in telewalking, what can be the, the some inhibitors to ease these technology, uh, techno stress? and um, uh, the bad influence on mental health? That's my question. Yes, any, any comments on that? Yeah, so I think the right to disconnect is, you know, kind of a policy that's, that's been designed and aimed really specifically for the digital environment, because as you say, the, the kind of increasingly digital world makes it harder to disconnect but then specifically on, you know, one, one interesting discussion, for example, is long Zoom meetings are very tiring, for example. Like that is actually, it seems to be increasingly clear that that is actually the case. Um, and so it makes sense, for example, if you're talking about the individual level, to, to try and make meetings shorter where possible to reduce the so-called Zoom fatigue or the, or the mental distress that's associated with just staring at the screen. But I think the bigger picture here is um, we need to also make sure the working hours are not getting longer or more irregular um, because that is a you know overriding factor that adds to that you know techno stress, should we say? Um, yeah. So you think the working hours should be shorter on on uh, on on teleworking? Is is that is that the message just... I'm getting? Yeah. Just to add to this, I think it's it uh, shouldn't mention that before, right? That the uh, stress check policy in, in Japan is a very interesting approach, except that it doesn't. It almost is a, a policy to avoid the real issue, right? We we keep working unhealthy long hours, and then we measure what impact it has. We all know it is very unhealthy, but we're not tackling the long hours, right? So in a sense, it's really solving the the, the wrong. The problem from the wrong side in, in many ways right so and i think that is becoming even more maybe in, in that sense i think the impact on of telework in japan is maybe different from other countries because you're work you're unhealthy you're working as unhealthy when you are in the office right i think in europe telework has really increased working hours and and the time you work has really has changed a lot i think maybe in japan that effect isn't so apparent because you had the same situation before in, in your office life but I think it's really, in that sense, it's, it's the stress check could be an interesting policy more for other countries. I think in Japan, it's the wrong policy to tackle the real issues and that the real issues are much deeper in, in culture and all that and, and very difficult to, to address, right? And I, I remember already 20 years ago, we have had discussions with the Japanese government where the ministry was really dedicated to re reduce working hours. And I remember the, the head in the office of that ministry, what he did is he said, I'm leaving the office at seven o'clock every day to make sure that my staff is also leaving. And now 20 years later, I think his, this is, it hasn't really changed the work culture, right? So that, that is so deeply entrenched. Otherwise, just wanted to say on, on your question on techno stress, I think there's, there's lots of literature around techno stress uh, going far back, right? And I'm pretty sure, I think it would be very interesting to see what happens on this because I, I suppose the challenges have are really changing dramatically now. And, and, and also here, I think we have an inequality issue in the sense that the type of uh, stress and, and possible mental health issues arising probably differ hugely between different types of, uh, of groups, depending on how used they were to working with such technology. If you suddenly are in a situation where I've never worked in such way, this is probably very different. While others are maybe as shown the sense experiences things like like Zoom fatigue, like if we take ourselves, right? We running from one such meeting to the other, it is actually different 
different world. And it's very difficult to feel yourself and you, that you need to, to break some of that. You can't have five Zoom meetings of two hours every day. This is not possible. Yes, thank you very much. I totally agree. And um, we can open, uh, we can invite Miss Enomoto to ask a question. Yes, um, thank you very much. Um, I found, uh, I recognize the importance of data and I found it interesting that um, many countries have data, but for example, countries like Japan do not have the data about the cases or the prevalence of depression or anxiety. And I would like to ask um, first, uh, how exactly do countries like United States collect those data and what what is it that hinders Japan from collecting those data? And if we are to collect the data, uh, who should be responsible for it? Uh, for example, is it the government or the nonprofits or other organizations? Yes, please go ahead. Maybe I can give some background on, you know, the kind of countries that collect data and, and how they do it. So. The, the two examples I gave um, in the presentation, I think, were France and the US. A number of other countries like UK, Canada, um, New Zealand, certainly Belgium, these countries collect data on a regular basis. Um, now, specifically on anxiety and depression, the prevalence of these mental health conditions or symptoms of these mental health conditions, um, countries tend to use a set of validated instruments um, such as the GAD-7, which is the Generalized Anxiety Disorder um, 7 scale. And then um, for the for depression, it's PHQ-9, which is the, um, the health questionnaire. So these are the kind of instruments that um, countries can, can use. Um, and they are designed in a way to kind of, they, they are subjective, right? Because they ask, to what extent do you feel X and how often, things like that. But um, they are validated um, and if you use a consistent measure across time, then that allows for, for comparison. And then in terms of, um, yeah, so I think the, both U, the US uses these, these uh, instruments and then France, for example, is a slightly different instrument um, for depression, but like it follows a similar principle. And then in terms of who is best placed to do this, um, well, in the case of France and the US, um, I understand that it's a government-led initiative. So actually, if you want to look at, you know, the prevalence of symptoms, um, then you go on to the, I think it's the Department of Health and Human Services for the US. And for France, it's uh, Santé Publique France, which is um, the, the public health organization. So um, I don't see why it would be an issue for, um, you know, with the adequate measures in place for governments to, you know, collect this information through, and it will be done through surveys, right? So through, through regular surveys, um, in the case of US, I think it was once every two weeks in the case of France, a bit less frequently. Um, yeah, but either way, like it's not something that's easy either, right? It requires some degree of financial com commitment, presumably. Um, I don't know exactly how much it would cost to collect data on a monthly basis, for example, but, you know, without that data, it's very hard for us to know w which groups we need to target. And going back to this, issue of inequalities, it's really important that we're not actually causing a widening of inequalities in mental, in mental health outcomes. And the policies are getting to the people that need it most, if that makes sense. I just yes. wanted to add two thoughts. I think it's very, very relevant questions. I'm happy you asked this question. I think while the US and France are two examples where the data collection was government led, uh, what we do see now is actually a increasing uh, role for the public sector because quite in, in quite a few countries we see that it's actually the research sector where where this is coming from it's through from hospitals or jointly with some research groups which is organizing the data collection i think it's actually not that expensive to do this exercise so it's really more taking a decision to do it so i think especially in countries where the government is slow there's more space than ever before for the private sector to chip in and I see in some countries that these institutions, uh, well, they are suddenly becoming very important and recognized just because of their, because they were the first movers in, in this uh, area, so to speak, right? So I think we do probably see a bit of a, a shift away from, from government control over these. And, and there's no need that this is 
for this to be government-led, right? Any company can do that if you do it properly. I can, can just I... take... Oh. Are you done? Doc? Yeah, no, I was just yeah. going to add that in that kind of context, the UK, for example, is a very interesting example where there's a lot of data on mental health collected by all kinds of actors, including the government, from the charity sector, the nonprofit sector, from hospitals, from schools, from you know, providers of mental health apps, for example. So, like, you know, that there is a wide range of actors that can collect that data. I think it's just important that to some degree, you know, that that data is then collected in the in the right way and then actually is used to drive policy policy change. Kurt, since um, we're running out of time, I'll only take one question and I'll give it to Joan because she hasn't asked a question yet. Joan, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Yeah, this has been, you know, really interesting and informative. I will take off my mask. <laughs> um, I just had two very brief questions. One is um, in terms of research, uh, we ourselves did a survey. I work with a big Buddhist group here. We did a survey among 20,000 young people last year and found results that seemed a bit contradictory in terms of people claiming less so-called social connection, but improved friendships, which I think is something that maybe all of us are finding in a strange way. And I thought there really is a need for more qualitative or really in-depth research. And I wondered what your response would be to that and then the other question is what you see the role of media can be in terms of you know lessening the shame around this issue perhaps particularly in japan thank you yeah so i think qualitative data is extremely important right because if we're thinking about making better mental health policies uh, who, who are we talking about right we're talking about people who experience mental health issues and so you know making sure that people with lived experiences are at the center of that is really important and you do see um, again i'm sorry for always using the uk as an example but the in the uk for example you do see many um, non-profit actors really doing like a qualitative study of mental health you see that um, also in countries like the us and australia um, I've seen less of it in Japan, but that might also just be because I'm not quite as, my antennas aren't quite quite as up. So I think there's definitely um, a place for that and thinking about how can that can be used to um, improve mental health services. So like a good example with that is Australia, for example, the Headspace, which is um, a mental health service, or these are youth centers that provide mental health support for young people. Um, they've kind of done a survey also on how happy they were with the experience of remotely offered mental health services. And actually quite a lot of people were happy with that, which suggests then that the scope to um, kind of think about how to provide both in-person and digitally enabled services going, going forward. And then in terms of the role of the media, um, the language we use around mental health is, is quite important, I think, in that context. So for example, in our brief, we talk about youth mental health crisis. Now that framing is useful from a policy context because what we're saying is we need to drive policy reform. We need to use the current momentum in order to make better mental health policies for young people. Um, but if, for example, you know, a, a counselor, for example, is talking to someone experiencing mental health issues and says, we are as a society having a mental health crisis, um, you are a lost generation. This language is not very useful at all. And so it is difficult. And I think the language that we use really matters. And then in terms of media, I think maybe thinking beyond suicide when it comes to mental health, I think that would be a really big step forwards, talking about the prevalence of, you know, so-called more common forms of mental health conditions and mild to moderate uh, mental health conditions. Um, and that would help broaden that discussion um, because suicide is a very significant issue, but um, it's only part of the big picture. And I think that big picture is often missed. Maybe just to add one one thought on on how we can uh, facilitate the change. So I, I'm not sufficiently aware of the the media landscape in, in in Japan. But what what we do see across countries is that leadership is extremely important, and role models are extremely important. And I could well imagine that a country like Japan, which is 
in my understanding, probably more hierarchical than many other OECD countries that top leadership role model approaches are could be driving the, the fastest change, both within the company, but also uh, like if, it, if a top politician would talk this about this in the right way at the right moment and including, of course, um, revealing their own mental health issues, that could make uh, a big difference. Um, I don't know whether we have seen any like that in Japan, really role models all over, right? In culture, in sports and wherever this is having impact. And then we come back to the, that brings the media discussion back in, right? Of course. Yes, thank you very much. The session is supposed to be closed, so it's 7.30. I just want to thank the two speakers. It was uh, particularly important that we have this session and listen to you. Um, Japan is, you know, going in through a very bad um, infection surge. Uh, we don't know what to do. We're uh, without alcohol. <laughs> we're uh, uh, restaurants are closing, um, and also we're so unsure of whether the Olympic Games are going to be held or not. So, in this dark moment, moment, and you know, one and a half years almost after the pandemic has really affected society here. Thank you very much for your insights and uh, your information. Thank you very much today. Thank